love one another. It's a command that appears, I think, some 17 times in the New Testament. Jesus commands it here in John chapter uh, 13. Uh, Paul uh, repeats it. Peter uh, repeats it. Interesting, Peter says twice, love one another deeply. John, in his letters, uh, repeats it. I think we're to get a message. Love one another. Uh, we're going to uh, pick up uh, that command from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus speaking to his disciples there in the upper room uh, before his betrayal and death. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love. So if you love one another. It's three times in those verses that Jesus speaks uh, this uh, truth. Well, let's think, first of all, then, of the command of Jesus. The command of Jesus at the beginning of verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. Clearly has great importance because it is his parting charge and order to them. Notice what he's just said in verse 33, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. Jesus is departing from them. This is his parting word to them. Really stresses the importance of it. As Jesus is about to leave them, he wants them to get this fact. A new command I give you, love one another. Uh, not only is it his parting word, he repeats it in this uh, upper room uh, discourse that he has with his disciples. Uh, so in chapter 15, and verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Again, in John 15 and verse 17, this is my command, love each other. So three times in these verses, three times in this uh, 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 conversation that Jesus has, love one another. It's a new command that Jesus gives. We know there is that Old Testament command, love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19 and verse 18, uh, uh, James in his letter calls that the royal law of scripture. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. But it's a new command. Uh, and I think what one writer says, in quality rather than in time. It's fresh. It's new also in the motivating example of it, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Originally, it was love your neighbor as yourself. Now it's love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. It's interesting. It's not abstract, is it? Jesus doesn't say be loving. No, he says love one another. There are that group of disciples sitting around him in that room. Love one another. That group of people that Jesus has brought together. Remember, Jesus chose them and brought them together. They're a very different group of people. In terms of class, uh, some fishermen, working class, and perhaps some uh, middle class. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector. We've got different classes. We've got different politics. And we've got uh, uh, Simon the Zealot, uh, who uh, was against uh, the Roman rule. We've got Matthew the tax collector who worked for the Romans. We've got different personalities. Peter, very forthright, as we've seen in our reading. James, son of Alphaeus, who we virtually know nothing about. He's very uh, different people love one another doesn't say love all the people who are the same as you no love one another this very disparate different uh, group of people that jesus has brought together love 
one another. Not only are they different, they're flawed as well. Uh, we know from the other Gospels that uh, earlier James uh, and John uh, have asked for the most prominent places in Jesus' kingdom. They want the places that is right and is left, uh, jockeying for positions of uh, prominence and honour. We know that they've been arguing about greatness. Who's the greatest? Peter. How flawed is Peter? You're not going to wash my feet. I'll wash my hands and my head. And I'll die with you. And these are flawed people. Love one another, Jesus says. And so love is to be concrete. Those sitting around together, love one another. And the command is needed because it's not natural. Self-love is our natural and default setting, isn't it? We love ourselves. It's our natural, that's our default setting. That's what we go to normally. We love ourselves. Maybe that's one reason why that measure was given in the old command. Love your neighbour as yourself. You're surely going to love yourself, but you've got to love your neighbour as well. But we need this command because self-love is our natural and default setting. John Calvin uh, astutely said, self-love keeps all our senses bound in such a manner that brotherly love is altogether banished. Self-love occupies us so much that for others, there's so little room in our love. The command of Jesus, it's his parting words to them. It adds solemnity and power to it. It's a very concrete command. Not be loving, abstractly and generally. No, love one another. And it's a command that's necessary and needed. That's why it's repeated 17 times in the New Testament. Because it doesn't come naturally. We need to be commanded uh, regarding it and be instructed and charged uh, with this uh, 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 truth. The command of Jesus, the command he gives. But then notice, secondly, the example of Jesus. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How had Jesus, how had Jesus loved? Well, even in that reading that we had in John 13, we see that Jesus loved with patience and long-suffering. Peter with his rashness and uh, uh, telling Jesus he's not going to wash his feet. And then uh, and then Peter uh, said, I'll, I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus loved with patience and long-suffering. That's how Jesus had loved uh, these men. But uh, earlier in the chapter, we're given uh, uh, another demonstration of Jesus' love. At the end of verse 1, uh, we're told, aren't we, in John 13, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. How did he do that? By washing their feet. By taking that uh, towel, pouring water into a basin, and one by one, uh, washing their feet in humble, selfless service. That's how Jesus loved, in humble, selfless serving. That's what Jesus calls us to. That's how Jesus loved. That's how he wants us to love. In humble, selfless serving. <clears throat> Jesus tells them that, doesn't he, in verse 14, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. We're doing a series of the one another's. We're not going to do one another's feet, but that's an expression of love, isn't it? Humble, selfless service. 
But Jesus uh, uh, expands on what he means uh, 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 about his love. Uh, again, in John 15, uh, verse 12, where this command is repeated, John 15 and verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Notice the next verse. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus does. Jesus lays down his life for us. That's the full extent of his love, giving his life for them. Paul takes up that theme in Ephesians 5 verse 2. Live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up. For us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus loved us to the extent of giving his life for us. That's the example, that's the model that we are uh, that we have. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another and uh, john takes up that theme in his first letter in 1 john uh, chapter 3 and verse 16 here's another famous bible 316 1 john 316 this is how we know what love is jesus christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Whew. John got the message. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions, sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. What are you giving up in expression of your love for others? What are you giving up in expression of your love for others? Status. Jesus gave up his status when he took that towel and washed his disciples' feet. Time. Money. Comfort and convenience. Your agenda. These are some of the things that you might give up to express your love for one another. Graham... Uh, Bainon, uh, in his little book, uh, God's New Community, has a chapter entitled, All You Need Is Love. Jesus defines love, uh, sorry. Jesus defines love for us in his death on the cross. And so he sets a model of how we are to love each other. Our love is to be patterned on his. So how did Jesus love us? First of all, a no matter what love. Jesus loved us when we didn't deserve it. So our love is to be unconditional. It is not to turn on what someone does for us. It is not dependent on what our background is with that person, how much we like them or how well we know them. It is not to vary on what our future is with that person, whether we will ever see them again. In fact, this love is to be there even when that person has ignored us, offended us, or hurt us. That's an easy thing to write, but I am all too aware what a hard thing it is for us to do. But that is what Jesus did for us. And he says, love each other as I have loved you. So it's a no matter what love, unconditional, but also it's a painful love. Jesus loved us at immense personal cost. 
So our love, too, is to be sacrificial if need be. It is not to have limits of quantity or quality. There are to be no boundaries to it. It costs Jesus his life. And he asks that we love in the same way. As a result, we should expect our love to be painful sometimes. I'm not saying that it will be all doom and sadness, not at all. In fact, I think we will find loving people sacrificially a fulfilling and joyful experience, but it will cost us. It will cost our time, our energy, our money. It will drain us emotionally or physically. That's what Jesus expects. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The command of Jesus, love one another. The example, the model that Jesus gives, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Self-giving. Humble, selfless, service, sacrificial, painful for the good of others. The command of Jesus, the example of Jesus, and in verse 35, the disciples of Jesus. Uh, Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love. So if you love one another. <clears throat> It's a distinguishing mark of the disciples of Jesus, of Christians. It's something that sets them apart and distinguishes them. You can tell who they are because they love one another. If there is a, a horse and a zebra next door to each other, how can you tell them apart? How can you tell a horse and a zebra apart? They look quite similar uh, in the terms of the shape of their body. How can you tell a horse and a zebra apart? Help me, someone. A zebra has black and white stripes. It's different to a horse. It's set apart from a horse. It's black and white stripes. Distinguish it from a horse. Love for one another is something that should distinguish us and set us apart. Then people should be able to recognize those people are disciples of Jesus. They're like Jesus, who loved selflessly, sacrificially, painfully. They're showing that love to one another. It's interesting that Paul uh, gives thanks in a number of his letters uh, for evidence of Christianity in the lives that he's writing uh, to the people he's writing to. And he mentions two things. He gives thanks for their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for the saints. He knows that they're Christians because of that. They've got faith in Christ Jesus and love for one another. Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, all have references uh, to Paul's uh, giving thanks for that evidence of Christianity. See, we're not just a club or a group. That happen to meet in the village hall. There are other groups that meet in the village hall here. Uh, Zumba classes and uh, Weight Watchers. Uh, 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 we, we don't, we, we're, we're not just meeting here occasionally. That's not what makes us who we are. It's not just that we have a shared interest in something. Christians love one another. They love one another. That should set us apart from the other groups that use the village hall. And that should be seen by other people uh, around us, that we love one another. Again, turning back to uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Is the distinguishing. So how do you tell the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil? Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Uh, John's reminding us of that command. This is 1 John 3, verse 12. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. 
Why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life in him. It's a distinguishment. That's how we can know if we are uh, 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 those, uh, um, if we pass from death to life. Other people can know that because we love one another. That's how we can know because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's something that sets Christians apart uh, and uh, distinguishes them uh, from other groups uh, and uh, uh, other clubs. That we love one another with a Christ-like love. What is this love? Found a very helpful definition from the uh, Puritan John Owen. What is this love? It is a fruit of the spirit. We need to establish that. It's not natural. It's a fruit of the spirit, an effect of faith, whereby believers being knit together by the strongest bonds of affection. That's a lovely sentence. Knit together. If you like your knitting, knit together by the strongest bonds of affection upon account of their interest in one head, Jesus Christ. It's our union with Christ that unites us with one another and participating of one spirit do delight in value and esteem each other and are in a constant readiness for all those regular duties whereby the temporal spiritual and eternal good of one another may be promoted i like his uh, things there uh, a constant readiness for all those duties whereby temporal spiritual eternal good of one another may be promoted what is love oh, that's a good description uh, uh, from uh, john owen this is the love that we are to demonstrate not just in word and tongue, but in action and in truth. And if we do that, people will recognize that these people are disciples of Jesus, the ultimate lover. Uh, these people who love, they've been with Jesus uh, and they're like Jesus. We, we long for others, don't we, to enter into this family of love by the grace of Jesus uh, to them. The command of Jesus, love one another. A command that he repeated, a command that uh, uh, Paul and John and Peter repeated, a command that comes 17 times in the New Testament. Get the message. The example, the model we have. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The disciples of Jesus are distinguished by this. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for the other. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. Lord, you've set us such a high standard. Forgive us, Lord, for our failure. Forgive us, Lord, for those times we've not even tried to reach that standard. Thank you for your spirit who you have given to infill us. Lord, may we know uh, uh, that fruit that he produces in increasing measure. measure. But Lord, for our blessing, for your glory, and for a testimony to the world around us. For our Saviour's sake. Amen.